Hi, I'm Charlie Brown. I do marquetry. Today, we're going to turn this into this. Worker and new marketarian. I say new because I've only been doing it about eight or nine years. Prior to that time, I had never heard about marketing. Didn't know what it was. My first exposure to it was at the Clean Sport Expo. There was a booth there that had the marketry club. They were cutting these gorgeous pictures that really enthralled me and I couldn't wait to find out about it. And what impressed me even more was the little saw that they were using to do these things. So I've always been someone that liked to make tools or might make things for use in what I do in the shop. And so I asked them, could I take a picture of the saw? They accommodated me. I went home and I made one. It didn't work as well as I had expected. So I started doing a little research and came up with a little better version of the saw. Now, and we'll get into the saw and its uses and, and how it's made in, in just a minute. But that's a little bit of background. What we're, uh, our purpose here today is to introduce you to marquetry. We, uh, I'm going to cut a marquetry picture. It's going to have seven pieces. It's going to show the process. I picked a, a pattern that uh, will demonstrate what you need to know or how you need to operate the saw. And the method that we're going to use is called the double bevel method. And it's called, it's called that because there's two pieces of veneer. One is attached but with tape to the back of the other. And the saw blade, as you cut it, is on a 12 degree bevel. So both pieces, the front piece and the back piece, have that 12 degree bevel. The advantage of that is when you cut the two, you take the piece off the back and incorporate it into your foreground, it eliminates any kerf that the blade makes. The blades are very thin, in fact, and the teeth are very fine. Hard to see with the naked eye. A lot of times you just have to feel the blade. They're called jeweler's blades, and they're available from, from a jeweler supply stores. Um, Let's, let's take a minute here and let me show you what tools are necessary to do this. And one of the, we'll get to that in just a second, but one of the things that uh, really makes sense to me about marquetry is it's available to people or it accommodates people that have small spaces to work in. It's not a very terribly messy uh, art form to get into. Um, you can do it in a small space. You don't have to worry too much about the dust. It makes a little bit of dust, but not much. Uh, and it doesn't take up a lot of space. It doesn't take a lot of money to get involved in it either. So the tools that are involved. Uh, let's just go through them briefly. You're going to need to punch a hole through the two pieces of veneer that I'll demonstrate in just a minute. And um, there's various ways to do that. You can drill the thing, you, the, the access hole, or more handy is to use just a uh, large sewing needle or a tool that has a point, like an awl. Uh, you'll, with a little practice, you'll figure out what, exactly what size you need, and that's dependent on the blade that you choose to cut the marketry. So there's your awl, uh, a, a good pair of tweezers, really fine point. You're going to need an embossing tool. This particular one has two different sizes. That's for tracing your pattern. You have to trace the pattern through uh, some graphite paper. And you need something to cut veneer with at various stages. Most of the cutting is going to be done on the saw, which I'm about to show you. But you're going to need to cut some independent pieces and a, uh, a scalpel or a craft tool uh, works very well for that. I, I chose the scalpel because it fits my hand better. It's a little, little uh, narrower. It gives you greater control. You're going to need some uh, graphite paper, black, which you use most of the time, and white so when that you trace the pattern on a dark piece of veneer, you can see it better. 
Okay, and the saw. Let me let me touch on the saw because I know that's going to be one of the first questions. This particular saw is is called a a, a marquetry saw. It was developed by John Effler. Um, this one is considerably different from the plan that I bought to do this saw. I've made several changes to it, but I'm going to show you this one briefly, and I'll show you or give you a reference to the plan should you want to make your own saw. So let me uh, let me show you the the workings basically. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that okay? Basically, it's a box. And the back of the box has a quarter inch piece of plywood with a 12 degree angle cut in it to accommodate the slide that holds the blade. You can see in, in the back there. This is just a piece of uh, maybe two inch by three quarter uh, hardwood stock and to that is attached a drawer slide. This particular one is 10 inches, I think. That allows you to move this blade that's attached to this steel tube. And it's, it's set on a 12 degree belt. So uh, basically that's it. There's also a little break in the back here because at some point in time, you're gonna need to stop the blade, uh, uh, disassemble or, or Re uh, disassemble the top so that you can pull it through the veneer and then you want to press it again to release the action on the uh, on the saw itself. Now it's got a spring there so that it's uh, more comfortable than trying to operate it strictly by hand. This one as you can tell is a little more decorative than you might expect for your first one and believe me this is not my first one. So uh, I decided since I was going to be doing marquetry that I needed to have a presentable saw. So I put a, uh, a trout, as you can see, in the top there. A little more elaborate, and it takes a little more experience to be able to do that, but not a whole lot. This is, this is not rocket science. It's, uh, it's something that you can do. The materials for the saw, I mentioned the drawer slide, the spring, the little handle, most of it's hand-cut stuff. The tubing here is three eighths inch steel brake line. So you buy that at the auto parts store and then you have to figure out how to bend it to uh, without kinking. And there's some, there's some tips on that at various places. There's a keeper up here that, that holds your uh, tiny saw blade. Details of that are in this plan I'm gonna reference here in a few minutes. So it, uh, it's not an easy piece to build. It, uh, it requires a fairly uh, well-equipped shop to do it and some, uh, some woodworking as, as well as some metalworking to thread uh, connections. So, uh, and then it's just held to the tabletop with a clamp. Uh, attach it to a place where it's very close to your, wood, your um, working space so you, you can move a chair back and forth and it, it, it works out pretty well. So basically this is all the space that you need to do this. Um, Okay, what is marquetry? Marquetry uh, is loosely defined and there is several different definitions of marquetry. Basically, it is taking pieces of wood veneer. Uh, you can even use shell or um, metal and incorporate it into a thin piece of veneer, like a... Uh, uh, well, veneer that uh, that we're going to use here, or you could do it in in various other materials, but typically it's done with wood veneer. Um, inlay is uh, is another term that is used a lot with marquetry, but it's two different processes. Marquetry is creating the piece in a thin piece of veneer. Inlay is when you take that or other items and you sink it into a surface. For instance, this tape dispenser. The piece, the diamond piece here with the lettering is marquetry. The process to put it into the tape dispenser is inlay. So that's the, the definition. And you'll get various opinions on that uh, definition uh, 
as well as techniques used in marketry. So just because I show you something here today doesn't mean that somebody else hasn't done it completely differently. It's a matter of uh, preference. So uh, there's a there's a, a book I can recommend to you, and it was one of it was the first book that I got when I got into marketry. I'll show you a copy of it. It's a, it's available here at uh, Clean Spore or online. It's called Basic Marketry and Beyond by Ken Horner. Very good book, detailed. Um, it's available to you. I would uh, recommend it. Uh, the other thing uh, about the uh, reference material, and that is the plan for the saw. As you can see, the saw that's on the, uh, the booklet that I used to make this one looks a lot different than the one I did. And it has a lot of, uh, mine has a lot more features to it. So I've improved or I have varied from the, the plan quite a bit. But it was available when I started this eight, 10 years ago. I don't think it's in print now, but you can go online and find it at various places. Uh, one of which is the Rocky Mountain marketry guild so if you drill down through there as and uh, you can find a downloadable plan and go from there and make your own so what we're going to do now is we're going to go immediately into uh, cutting uh, a piece just after i show you uh, a few things here that you can expect to do with marketry this is this is the the flower, or I guess it's a rose, that we're going to make today uh, has seven pieces, and I'll show you the techniques in just a minute. Some of the things that you can expect to be able to do with a little practice are, I'll show you a few items here. This is one that I've done fairly recently uh, that I like and my wife likes even more. In fact, I had to sign a release to get it out of the house. But uh, there's that one. This one's a pretty recent one. And, and uh, it's, it's framed in veneer. There's various uh, different ways to frame your work after you get it through. But, and we'll get into that in just a few minutes. The one that I, uh, I cut to in the last couple of days that I just showed you. Here, here are the... Uh, the, the background material, and here are the pieces that I cut the pieces that are in the picture from. So you can see it doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, you can be economical with the with the veneers, uh, and I would encourage that because they're they can get a little pricey depending on uh, what you choose. And I like to use um, natural materials where I can, although I, I will use colors as I did in the rooster there. So let's go ahead and, um, and get into making one. We're gonna make the rose from scratch. Uh, I'm gonna apologize up front. If it takes too long for you, you can just fast forward to the, to the end if you want. But basically that rose teaches you the technique. And the technique is basically a process that you have to follow to make everything blend together. And that would, it, that's demonstrated by this, this piece right here. I don't know if I'm in focus here or not. But you can see the rose, uh, as I said, it's got, what, four petals, two leaves, and a stem. If you can see the, the process that we're going to use here, you cut from the piece that's furthest from your field of vision first so that the following pieces can be cut into that piece. That demystifies marketry for me. So in other words, this piece in the back, that's the furthest piece from, from my vision as I see it. Everything else builds on top of that. And it would be followed by this piece, which is behind the next two pieces that you're gonna cut. So you've got to cut the furthest, progress from that toward the front. So order of cut, one, two, three, four, five and six are interchangeable. You could do one before the other. The important thing is you want to be able to cut the stem into those two pieces because they're going to overlap a little bit to give you that curve line that disappears. 
and you'll see that as I cut. So we're going to get immediately into the cutting, and we're going to use similar materials to the piece that I just showed you. And I'm going to keep it here so I can uh, I can reference it. So we said one was the the piece furthest from us, and it's in the top. So the process is this: let's let's uh, trace with our, our graphite paper that first piece. Now I'm going to cut, I'm going to trace it exactly as it's drawn here. But if you get off a little bit, no one is going to know. So you come on down. Now here's the part that's important. You have to cut into these two pieces because you're going to make that line disappear when you cut pieces two and three. You see? Okay, so there's our piece that we're going to cut. Now, the piece that we want to show through that cut as it's made is this dark piece. Uh, I think that's fumed eucalyptus. So it's important now that you put it in back of the traced line and you hold it up to a light so you can see where your piece is back there. I don't know if that shows up on the camera or not, but, but anyway, it's, it's sitting back. And I'm going to put it near the corner and I'm going to align the grain so that it's going up and down as that petal would appear. So there it is. I'm going to transfer it to the table. I'm going to tape it with masking tape. This is just regular three quarter inch masking tape that you can get anywhere. Nothing special about it. But you want to, the masking tape does two things. It holds this back piece in place so it doesn't move while you're cutting. And it also provides a little bit of uh, um, lubrication to the to the blade as you cut. Uh, and then so I've confirmed that I'm there. I'm gonna next. I've got to make my entry hole for the blade. Now the place that you make the entry hole is the place that you're going to cut out later. So you don't want to cut it up here at the top, so the hole will be uh, a little bit uh, obtrusive or or easy to see. So I'm going to cut it down here at the bottom because I know I'm going to cut over that. So just press it in there until such point. Well, I didn't put enough tape. Let me put one more piece of tape because I can see the hole better in the tape. Okay, I started the hole. I come around here until I can see it come through. I'm going to enlarge it just a little bit to make sure I can get my my blade through there. And then I'm going to feed the blade. Okay, see how the blade comes right through? Press it down holding the blade. If you don't, and you let the blade cr crimp, it's going to break. That's the other thing. I hope this doesn't happen today, but it's easy to break a blade and it, they'll break, break for a number of reasons. Wear, heat, uh, bending them. So you just have to be careful with it. Now the brake is set so that that allows me to load the tension on this bar. So I put it in the, in the blade holder. And you see how the blade I don't know if the camera will allow that to see that, but you can you can tell that the uh, yeah there it is. You can see that the uh, the blade uh, tubing is tilted. That's about twelve degrees. That'll create that double bevel as I cut. So let's cut. And I'll, you always cut in a clockwise position. Now I've got the teeth on the back side here, and and the only I can't see them, but I can feel them. Teeth down and on the back side. Fingertips close to the blade so that you don't allow this piece to go up and down on you. Those of you that do scroll saw work, uh, you've got a leg up already, but you don't have to have any previous experience to do this.
an object is to end up in the same hole that you started. There you go. So this piece that just popped out, that's the waste piece because I don't need it. That's the background. I'm going to use the piece that's below it. Charlie, have you ever considered putting a foot pedal on that? I have one. Uh, haven't touched it since the first day I finished it. This didn't work very well. I just, I don't know. It's a hands-on thing. And, uh, you know, another method, too, is a, a scroll saw. I mean, the foot-powered one, I've seen it. I've seen it. I haven't seen it used successfully, but uh, I've seen it. A lot of people do use scroll saws. That's a whole different technique. Uh, blade sizing, you can still cut on the double bevel, but it's a, it's a little, uh, it didn't suit me. I tried it. Okay, there's my, there's my usable piece right here. I'm just going to punch it out and put it on the side. I'm going to take the piece off now because I don't need that anymore. In fact, I'm going to use that same piece for the stem in a few minutes. So I'll put it off to the side. Now, you always glue from the back side. So this, here's my brush. I just want to get the sawdust out of there. There's the back side. I've got some uh, paper towel here just to, to uh, blot up the glue because you're going to use a fair amount of glue. I like to use, and this is just Elmer's school glue, basically. Nothing special about it. The glue in this case is just a, it's a temporary measure to hold those pieces in place until such time that you glue this entire completed picture to a piece of MDF or your substrate. It doesn't have to be MDF. Okay, so I'm going to use a, a toothpick if I can find it. There it is. And I'm going to spread a little bit of that glue in that opening. If you're a little messy, don't worry about it. This will blot it up. So I'm going to lay that down with the back side up, and I'm going to insert the piece that I cut out. And you have to keep track of that piece because the back of that piece is what you want to show through the back of the picture. The back is the piece with the tape on it. So now, if I did this correctly, it'll snap right into that hole there, and you can't see the curve line. I'm going to tear a little piece of this off, blot up the glue, and I'm going to go ahead and take that tape off if I can find my handy-dandy tool. Here's the other tool I neglected to show you a while ago. This is just a, um, you can buy this at Hobby Lobby. It's a uh, sculptor's tool, sharp on the, the sides and pointy on the end. It works great for removing the tape. Helps to have a little garbage can beside you here that I neglected to bring. All right, I put it in there, and I'm going to tape, tape it in place. Just The tape's there just to hold it temporarily. Okay, and there's the piece. Now, I'm going to hold it up to the light here, but you see there is no curve line there. I don't know if the camera will accommodate me here, but there's no curve line. You can't see any daylight through there. And that's the beauty of the double bevel method. Okay, let's move on to the next piece. And we numbered those uh, before we got started, so we're not surprised as we go through here. So the next piece I'm going to use, and I'm looking at my pattern, is number, the second piece, number two. And that's this piece of uh, curly ambrosia. So I'm going to put, put that in there on the back side, tape it in place. Making sure, oh, I got to draw it first. Okay, number two. Now, I'm going, it's a similar method that I use on number one. So I'm going to, to I'm going to start right here. Number two goes just like this. Cuts into number one, and it goes beneath what's going to be two and three. Okay. And the hole that I'm going to make is down here on the bottom because it's going to be cut away and become waste. Okay, now I'm ready to put my piece on the back. Make sure that I cover that. Put it over here in the corner so I'm not wasting a lot of veneer. 
line up the grain the way I want it and put some tape across it. I'm going to use another piece here because it's curled a little bit and I don't want it flopping around. Okay, go back over, find the piece that you can find a place to put the hole in. Here again, it didn't show on my tape, but maybe I can find it. Okay. Then you've got you've got infinite control with with this saw. You can start, stop, control your speed. Turn on a dime. Now I mentioned using the white graphite paper. This would be a perfect case to use it, but I know about where it goes and I'm not, I'm not concerned with exactly where it is, but you know, it, it just curves through there. And as long as I hit the mark as I come out of it, I'm, I'm good to go. Now, the, the way you use the saw, uh, various people do it different ways. So uh, you can make a full stroke and cover probably two and a half, three inches of the blade, or you can use strokes that are probably maybe an inch long which is what I prefer to do. All right, you see now it gets in the end there and it's a little prickly, but it comes comes out. No damage done to my saved piece. This is my trash piece. Set the blade, remove the tension, clean it up a little bit, take the piece off the back and I'm ready to glue that in. Okay, and I don't think I'm going to need that piece again. Okay, same process. Make sure everything's cleaned up. A little bit of glue. Try not to make a big mess. Tape on the back side. Snaps right into place. Flush. The other thing, there's a variety of veneers and uh, as, as far as sources go. And if you're a member of a club, and I would really encourage you, in fact, I'll show you a... Uh, a membership form. I would really encourage you to to join a club so that you can meet, talk with people of similar interest, attend their demonstrations. It also is an excellent place to swap veneers, um, talk about procedures. You're going to find that the older veneers are much thicker than the newer veneers because of the process they use to cut the veneers now. So. What you want to do is pick your veneers based on your preference as far as grain and color, but also pick veneers that have the same thickness. And there is a tremendous amount of difference. You can get by with a little bit of difference, but if you start using veneers that have a lot of difference in thickness, uh, it's going to be tough to finish it. You get, you, and eventually you're going to have to sand the thing down. And therein lies a problem when you try to sand the thicker veneers with a thinner veneer it's surrounded by a thinner veneer. So you can see that might be a problem. Okay, let's, let's cut uh, the next piece, which according to our order here is number three. Same exact process. 
I'm going to go into piece number four because it's going to be waste. Or that piece that's overlapping it will be waste. Okay, we're ready to pick the piece that we're going to do that with. Put it on the back side. Make sure that it's covered and that our, our grain is in the direction that we want it. Apply enough tape to hold it in place. And then make our point of entry, which is going to be down here on, on part four. Sometimes you have a little bit of trouble getting it through the hole, but if you do, you just have to take it back off and enlarge it just a little bit. Now, should you forget about the direction of cut, you're gonna to have to recover because the, the pieces will not fit together. In other words, I'm gonna cut in a clockwise rotation here. If I were to turn this around and start going counterclockwise, no, not gonna happen with the blade sloped this way. It's, there's gonna be a, a probably a 30 second gap all the way around that piece. So important that you cut in a clockwise rotation with this blade set up. Make sure you throw away the right piece. I'm going to need that piece for the next pedal as well. But I'm going to go ahead and glue this one in first. And another question is, well, how long do you have, how long does that glue have to, to uh, dry? I think it, it probably dries in 10 minutes, but that doesn't mean that you can't go ahead and cut through it. Now, if, you're, if you've got a small piece there that you're worried about popping out, you want to give it a little more time and maybe move on to another piece, if you can do so without upsetting your order of cut. Just like I told you. Order of cut is very important, but you do have some um, options. For instance, like piece five and six here. It doesn't matter, really. I could cut this piece before that piece. It doesn't matter. But it's because I'm going to cut through both of them uh, eventually anyway. Okay, I'll drop my piece here. Okay.
And I'm going to take a little care with this one because as I come through here, I don't have a place to hide this cut because there's nothing that overlaps this cut. So I've got to be I got to be careful here that I cut exactly where I want it to look, like where this stem joins it. I got to I got to be careful with that, or I'm going to end up with something that doesn't suit my eye. Okay, I'm going to use the same piece here. Although I might, yeah, I'm going to use the same piece. And see, this is where the um, the artistic vein comes in, and that is in picking the colors and picking the the grain patterns that you want to use. And you know, that's a weak point for me. So I consult my wife, who I consider uh, to be more artistically inclined, for advice on that, and she she guides me well. Okay, so I'm just going to pick a point that is inconspicuous. Hard to do on point four, but I think it's going to be right here where this V is. You see the V made by the previous cut and the cut that I'm going to make. And it's also going to be the connection point for the stem. It's a little bit more inconspicuous than it would be out here somewhere. So that's where I'm going to choose to do it. And there again, I've missed my... point where I want to punch through, but... All right, you see I punched through there. The grain broke through a little bit. No need to worry because that's going to be hidden by the stem. So I'm not worried about that little bit of piece uh, pop out there. But if I were, and it w wasn't going to be hidden, then I would save, I would take it out with my tweezers, save it, and reinsert it. See, I guess I've done enough of it. I don't, even, I don't even think about the direction of cut anymore. I always look at it, and if my blade is on the left, I know I'm, I'm going in the right direction. Splitting up, don't worry about it. That's a waste piece. And this is a, a Primavera, uh, so it's, it's prone to split. All right, I've noticed my tape is on the back side. I want to make sure that, uh, and it becomes even more important whenever this, this piece is, let's say you're cutting something and it's circular, nearly a perfect circle. 
it, but it never is because you cut it and it's not perfect, but it's approaching perfect. It's important that you put that oval or circle back in there in the same orientation that it was when you cut it. It's very hard to do that if you, especially if you put uh, some glue on there, it gets a little blurry. So you might want to mark, put a little reference mark on there. As you pull it out, it's still stuck on there. So you put a little reference mark there and there or at some common point that so that you don't have to worry about uh, differences in the fit. I'm not. I'm not sure. I know which tool you're talking about. It's it's very similar, but uh, it's used in the craft industry for peeling back masking. And I'm sure it would be things like that without the surface. I'm sure it would be just perfectly fine. You know, you just need something that's uh, that has a tip, and and the sharpness matters a little bit. Uh, so, whatever you can use uh, to do that, I, I'm sure various other tools would be acceptable. Okay, let's see. Um, so I, what I told you before, and I think in, in the importance of time here, I'm going to cut two more pieces. Uh, I'm going to cut five, and then I'm going to do the stem. Um, just to show you that last finish up there. But uh, I, you know, I'm conscious of uh, also the time factor here. So we'll, I'll just do that, and, uh, and I'll show you the finished one, and, and we'll just move on. I want to discuss a little bit about framing techniques okay five now here's what so here's what you got to worry about here you want to make sure that part of five extends into the stem which is seven i didn't mark it but it's the stem is the last part so i'm going to start there and take care of it i'm going to put a little bubble in there so that when i do this stem i'm cutting through it and you won't see any curve lines Okay, and the stem we discussed, it's going to be a, another piece of this dark. Um, or I'm sorry, we're going to do the, the uh, leaf first. And this is a piece of uh, poplar. So there's, uh, there's the uh, heartwood and the sapwood in poplar and, the, and any other tree for that matter. But the green is a, a natural, gives you a little natural uh, green color, and it works well for leaves. Okay, make sure I've got it covered tape it And I'm going to start with the piece that's behind the stem. So I'm going to start down here. And you can take a little liberty too as you're going through and you've got the pattern there but if you say well that would look better with a little bit more curl up here you can certainly do that let's do it all right i want to curl this a little bit more
All right, see, I didn't panic because that's all trash. As long as that green piece didn't do that, I'm good to go. And I don't think it did. Okay, backside glue up. Works better if you pull the glue parallel to the surface rather than perpendicular to the surface. Sometimes that piece is a little bit stubborn to pop back in, so you just use a little block of wood to kind of smooth it in there. Okay, let's do the stem and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. I just want to do the stem so you can see how it fits. And I can always add six later if I want to. Uh, gets a little messy there where the connection is, but I can make it happen. I don't need that. I need the uh, dark color. Okay, I'm going to use the dark color again for the stem. Thin pieces require a little bit more care, especially if that piece that you're cutting into on the back side is subject to splitting like this is. Uh, it should be okay here, but sometimes you end up having to do a really thin piece. It, it takes a little extra care. You have to go at a slower pace.
Losing a piece of your cut happens more often than you think. Many times I've been on the floor looking around for that piece, especially if it's very small. Okay, folks, we're nearing the point where I say, if you're in the class, are there any questions? But since you're not here, I'll have to anticipate them. So, so I think it went fairly well, the cutting of the piece. Sorry we didn't get to finish, but that's okay. The, the, the technique was the um, important thing here. So you see, you see how it's done. Here's, here's the one that I did that's completely finished with the other pedal. Very similar. Um, so the important thing to remember here is this is doable. You can do this, and it's not that complicated. It doesn't take a lot of uh, an experience. It doesn't take a lot of experience to get pretty good at it quickly. So it just, But it does take some practice. Um, as I said, I provided you with a couple of... Uh, uh, references I think will will uh, serve you well. The only the only part left here, and I'm just going to hit it briefly, and that is framing. So the next step in in completing this picture is putting some tape on the front side because we're going to remove the tape on the back, and you don't want to you don't want those pieces to disappear. So typically you can use a, this is called application tape. It's got uh, less stickiness or less tack, it's less tacky than, than common masking tape. You put a piece of this across the cut area, smooth it in very well so that you've got some contact, come around back, then you can take this off. You square up the edges on your picture. This is a five by seven uh, uh, picture. It's framed for five by seven. So you go ahead and cut it, making sure that it's square. And uh, and then you can do, uh, well, you can do one or two things. You, before you do that, you can, you can apply it to a piece of substrate or MDF. Um, and just have a frameless picture and paint the sides with black uh, uh, acrylic paint. You can do that, uh, or you can put a frame like I've done here. This is just a narrow piece of a quarter inch walnut with uh, rounded edges and put that on the edge. Um, so that's one option. The other option is you make your own picture frame or you can have it framed with picture framing materials, or you can do it with veneers. And that's the part I'm gonna show you just briefly how that's done. To do it with the veneer, you 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 have to fr uh, square this piece up, this finished piece. You square it up five by seven with ninety degree corners. That's very important. And then, typically, veneer type frames are an inch and a half wide, and they are on the pictures I showed you earlier. But what you're going to do with that piece after the the tape is removed from the back, in this case it hasn't been, but, but it should have been. Um, you, you take your strips in there that have true edges and you just lay it in a pattern around the finished picture. Uh, inch and a, at least an inch and a half wide. And typically you, you cut them like an inch and three quarter and then you cut it back to an inch and a half. But the edges is what people always have trouble with. I mean, the corners, the mitered corners. And it's, uh, let's face it, it's, it's pretty obvious. If you don't, uh, 
If your corner doesn't come out well, it's, it detracts from your picture. Uh, and this one is, um, you can see I've already done a couple and they're done just like this. They're overlapped in a pattern, a basket weave pattern all the way around. And then you just cut the 90 degree angle. And I'm gonna attempt to do one here. This is live TV. Or it seems that way to me anyway. Okay, so, so it's important that you square your device up and, and your, your, your device that you're gonna use here is basically anything that's a pretty durable material. And this, in this case, it's some, some sort of a trim work MDF. Uh, make sure that you cut it on a true 45. And in this case, I put a little bit of uh, adhesive-backed uh, sandpaper on there so it doesn't slide around. So I'm going to line this corner up with the corner of my picture, making sure that it is parallel to the cut picture. And I, I'm happy there. I've got a... Uh, non-slip surface on the back. So I'm just going to cut through this piece of veneer and this piece of veneer, and then what I'm left with is the finished product. So I'm going to do one, or attempt to do one. Light strokes, especially until you get it scored. Be careful when you get to the edges because it's going to want to split on you. So you go ahead and try to intercept that. So light cuts. Keep your knife up straight. And it feels like I'm through. So let's just see. So I'm gonna remove that piece. I'm gonna reach under here and grab this piece that's taped, and this has been taped for a while, so it's gonna probably be a little messy for you because as tape stays on there, it gets a little stickier. Okay, and see it, now it matches because you cut, you cut through one to get to the other so it matches. Once that process is done, you take your piece of MDF. Let's, let's talk a minute about MDF and the substrates that you can use to do this. Um, MDF is not the only thing you can use, uh, but it's chosen typically because of its stability. It's not going to expand or contract. Should that happen, it's gonna expand and contract at a different rate than your piece of veneer here. And it's gonna, it's, it's not gonna be pretty. It's gonna start splitting. So that's the reason that you just, you don't use a piece of wood to do this. You can use a, uh, a good grade plywood like Baltic birch. You can do that. It's, that's a reasonably stable material. The material of choice is MDF. Uh, medium density fiberboard, I think is what that is called. This particular one has veneer on both sides, and you can get that at a few places, but not everywhere. But most most large sheet goods stores, uh, you, you can get that, or some of them you can. You can get MDF almost anywhere. I would recommend to you that uh, you, you veneer the back side of it because you want to do the same thing to one side that you do the other. So if you're veneering one side, you want to put veneer on the back side. That, that uh, contributes to stability. So I would recommend that to you. All right, let's just say that we've got our picture cut here. The next step is to line this up. And, and what I would do is pencil mark around here on a, and we said this was five by seven, so you want an inch and a half, an inch and a half, so that makes eight. Seven inch and a half inch and a half makes ten. So you got an eight, an eight by ten picture that you're going to use there, and you've drawn a pencil line around here that's an inch and a half out. You line this up, and you check it to make sure that the corners of this MDF match where the corners come out on your 45 miters. So that's very important. 
So you've, you've got that, make any modifications in your line that you need to, and you're ready to glue this thing on there then. Glues. I use contact cement uh, simply because I don't want to get involved in a pressing situation where you gotta, you got to have a bunch of clamps and calls and uh, you can use a vacuum bag, and I've done, I've done all of that. But the contact cement is, is easier and quicker for me. Typically, I do several pictures before I get to the glue-up process so I don't have to go um, you know, get all that out and, and mess up a lot of materials. But anyway, that's pretty much the process. You, you apply the uh, contact cement to both surfaces as it's shown on the container. You make sure that when you start this thing down that you've got that corner there and here exactly where you want it and then you just ease it down and, and you should be you should be fine once that's done you roll it in then you trim up the sides you can use your cutting tool to trim up the sides everything matches up hopefully at that point and uh you can you then i typically use a uh, acrylic paint on the on the edge to uh to finish it so that's uh, that's all I know that I can take at this point. There are going to be an opportunity for you to attend some classes. Klingspor has uh, has told me that uh, they want to have some classes. They will make that available to you. Uh, you'll you'll have to sign up for them at the Hickory Klingspor store. The front desk will have a sign up sheet there, and you can get further information about that at a later time. Um, the finish is the only thing that we didn't discuss here today. And, and I, yeah, there's a variety of, of finishes that you can put on your picture. Uh, the one I like is a wipe-on finish, and it's this one right here. It's a little thinner than most wipe-ons. It's available here at Cleanspor. Uh, I really like that product, and uh, usually I put on three coats. It dries fairly quickly. Just wipe it on, make sure you don't have any streaks in it, and... Uh, that's what I would recommend to you, although you can use various other things. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, and um, I hope to see you at a class soon.